Okay, very good morning to you. Hope you're well. Hope you had a great long weekend if you're based in the UK or the US. Um, quick mention about the YouTube channel. Remember to, to like and subscribe. Uh, we have videos coming every day of the week now, so Monday to Friday from me with macro updates ahead of the European Open, a technical analysis, kind of trade setup video from Sam North, one of our senior traders. Um, he releases out on the Sunday, and then we get into kind of under the bonnet of some of the key macro topics in a bit more detail with Eddie, my colleague, on a Saturday. So don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Um, and also check out the website AmplifyTrading.com for any more information about us and what we do. But straight into the charts this morning and yeah, clear case for, for risk on uh, sentiment. Equity index futures up significantly. Uh, obviously everyone getting back into the swing of things, uh, albeit Europe was open, volumes particularly like yesterday as is normally the case with a kind of coordinated bank holiday market close in the US and the UK. So people coming back into market and a number of different things, whether it's central banks pledging further monetary policy support, whether it's continued reopening of economies without so far any real significant signs of a secondary wave of infections from coronavirus. Uh, we've had some comments out of China looking to alleviate some of the tensions from some of the protesting that was seen in Hong Kong over the weekend. And then some data yesterday on the European side, uh, some German iPhone numbers, particularly on the outlook, show quite a significant bounce as firms in Germany are becoming a little bit more optimistic. Now we're starting to see the phased uh, unwinding, if you like, of the stringency of the, the lockdown measures that have been in place in, in Germany. So a couple of different things all in the mix this morning, not one definitive thing, but it has meant that, you know, S&P is right back up there once again. And just going to pull that chart then into a bit of perspective. Um, you can see this is the, the, the move up that we've had since the overnight session through Asia and then as Europe has come in this morning. But putting this onto a daily continuation chart probably tells a bit of a better picture. There's that low that we had that we saw back on the 23rd of March after that big route that we had from a drop from pretty much 3400 down to into the 2100 handle. Uh, and here we are, we've, we've rallied nearly 40% now since that point. And you know, we're coming up to a longer term area of quite significant resistance. We're about 16 points shy of that at the moment in the S&P. Uh, as marked up here, which is really uh, the high that was seen around the 6th of March, but then what was capping some of the price activity through the summer uh, and autumn kind of of 2019 and also was a support point after the initial break uh, in the latter part of October, early November of 2019. Uh, so it'll be interested to see how the market reacts. The next kind of obstacle here to the upside, now that we've managed to really break through these previous areas that were holding up some of the price around 29.65.70, which you can see we've managed to firmly break uh, at the recommencement of trade today. Um, that was that high that we had back on the end of April, but also you can see it was a, a big area as well of resistance around a similar time uh, 12 months ago, kind of uh, April, early May time. Uh, so if we continue to push higher, did have a question about you know, where would we go next? Well, this is a, a real key test of where we are and uh, I guess any further risk appetite. If we can get ourselves above there, then I'll be looking up at areas probably to those lows that were seen back on the 3rd of December of 2019 that were coming at 69 and a half. And then a further push up, we'll be looking up at around those highs that were seen um, just before the fall at early part of March. So 30, 69 and a half, then 31, 13 and three quarters uh, would be the kind of areas. And then you'd have to be looking uh, further up as we continue to push probably these areas with that high on the 26th corresponding with the low on the 8th uh, would be up at 31, 80 and three quarters. So yeah, obviously these sorts of things are not gonna happen in, in one day, but could they materialize over a number of days or weeks? Uh, sure. Uh, and I'm sure there'll be plenty of those thinking, well, you know, looking at this almost V-shaped recovery, you've had equities and why not? Can we just continue to move up? And, you know, it does beg the question of, you know, what if we don't have, what if there is no second wave? Uh, what happens then? Uh, and then all things remaining equal, you've got to think that, well, yes, there's a tail risk with uh, further escalation in the trade war, but, you know, it seems somewhat like, uh, inevitable that we're going to push right back up all the way up to the all-time highs again. But look, 
a little bit early to start making that those types of noises I'd say at this point for the moment I'd say we're at a very key test uh, where we are now just given the scope of the rally that we've seen over the last couple of hours as US and uh, UK come back into market and that's this area here at 3026 we need to watch today if we did break that then I think a, a fairly swift move up then to the next target at this 69 and a half type area uh, is not off the cards then uh, at that point. Uh, so that's the equity story and the rest of the, the other assets and the, the kind of cross asset class move following suit. Uh, gold down a touch, $4. T-notes already down about 10 ticks. We've had a bit of a dip here as Europe have come in. Uh, Bun's obviously back in full flow, down about 50 ticks this morning. Uh, T-notes down 10. Uh, crude oil markets then in step then with the equity move it's kind of fitting in tandem with this overall global more risk appetite position in the short term and so crude oil continues to rally uh, we're up around a dollar and 25 cents at the moment in the july contract and we're coming up to uh, an area of potential resistance that we've seen on the 21st uh, so eradicating any of that dip that we've seen uh, back towards the tail end of last week um, we've got the R1 sitting just above that, so that 21st high at 3466 and 3480 is the R1 uh, for crude. And then the currency markets, uh, we've been seeing typically movement in the dollar uh, in respect to risk being that you know risk off, dollar strengthens, and then vice versa. And, and certainly then given the movement that we're seeing uh, across assets, the Dixie is down about a third of 1%, so both euro dollar and cable on the front foot. Uh, cable, despite a lot of the noise over the, the weekend in the UK about Dominic Cummings and so on, uh, just pretty much brushing that aside, uh, any of that short-term kind of risk or idea about potential more volatility coming uh, towards the end of June deadline for Brexit, just kind of being parked for the moment as the market's just reacting to the general risk on vibe and the, the weaker, weaker dollar this morning. So let me just run you through some of the headlines. As I said, Sam released a video over the weekend with all of the key technical levels to keep an eye on in more, more detail. So I'll let you review that in your own time. My job to get you up to speed then with the news and, and what's been going on. And you know, let's, let, let's just cover some of the stories of why is there such risk appetite this morning. Uh, and first of all, starting with China uh, and also a series of comments out of a number of the major global central banks. So with China, um, remember, at the end of last week, you had that National Party's con Congress where they did not explicitly outline a GDP target. And that was the first time that that's not happened in a very long time. And it did leave some question marks then about the difficulty markets would have in order to quantify the type of uh, fiscal or monetary support that the uh, authorities in China might provide in order to stimulate the economy. However, to, to kind of nip that in the bud somewhat, the PBOC governor Yi Gang came out overnight uh, and has said that China will strengthen its economic policy, continue efforts to lower interest rates on loans, uh, reinforcing expectations of further measures to basically support the economy through the pandemic. So I guess a little bit of, uh, I guess, further clarity, a bit of relief for markets who are a little bit uncertain given that particular end of that political conference of last week. Uh, just reassuring that they continue to remain flexible and prudent in terms of um, implementation of various different means to support their economy. Um, also, there were some further outbreaks over the weekend of large protesting that hadn't been seen in a while, obviously, uh, just given the containment and lockdown uh, to try and control the virus. Uh, but it did flare up again, and this came after that law was passed uh, looking to take away some of the, the legal rights over the city's autonomy in Hong Kong from mainland China. Uh, however, China looking to uh, not forcefully but politically manage the situation, you could say, uh, saying that Hong Kong's uh, judiciary to stay independent under new law. And, and that obviously lack of uh, independency is what people are getting particularly upset about. Um, so again, just looking to, to tackle that and alleviate any of those growing concerns uh, the Hong Kong market actually just responding fairly positively overnight as with the general global move that's been seen over the last couple of hours. And yes, China has come out and basically um, they've condemned the US for adding 33 Chinese entities to a trade blacklist, uh, but they did and have not come out and announced any new retaliatory kind of steps to counteract what the US have done. 
So a couple different things there uh, that are helping on the from the Chinese side. Uh, to supplement that, we've had Bank of Japan's Governor Kuroda come out uh, and not say anything particularly new, but again, it fits with that chorus of what central banks are saying uh, over the weekend that they, Bank of Japan, may take more steps to cushion the economic impact from the virus, um, however, may maintain their gloomy outlook, but generally saying that, look, we're ready to do more if that is what is necessary. And then that's similar to what was said by the ECB of the weekend. The ECB's Villaroy, more stimulus is probably on the way. And remember, again, kind of similar to China, the few question marks about, you know, can the ECB legally now expand upon their quantitative easing program, given that constitutional court ruling that came out of Germany, but having had this already reaffirmed by Lagarde, further from Villaroy at the weekend, that the idea here is not a matter of if, but when. Uh, and it could just be there coming into June meeting that we're going to see more uh, firepower from the ECB in the form of their QE. So um, you've got, again, just going through this, um, China saying, look, we're going to strengthen policy, we're going to lower rates. You've got Bank of Japan saying we're well, ready to go and do whatever's needed to, to stimulate the economy and ECB, more stimulus is probably on the way. So you know, these are the underlying obviously mechanisms that help drive market direction, support market confidence. You know, the idea that yes, there's obvious risks on the table, first and foremost, the pandemic, and secondly, this rising escalation recently, and we saw last week in the, the trade tensions. But as long as central banks are willing to do whatever it takes, that, that instills a degree of, um, of confidence in markets. Um, yesterday as well, for those who weren't um, in, we did have the release of German IFO business climate. Um, this is looking at the headline reading. Um, so for any of those who are unfamiliar with this, this um, IFO basically is a survey, it's a soft economic indicator looking at current and future expectations of what German companies think about their own domestic economy. And so from the headline reading, we did see a bit of a bounce. It came in at 79.5 from the very depressed level of 74.2 in April, which was the period of the, the most uh, kind of onerous of the lockdown when it was in play. Um, however, what we've had is a very steep rebound in the gauge measuring company's expectations about the future. And generally, we're talking about the six month outlook. And that improved to 80 spot one. 80.1 from 69.4 in April. So that was a huge jump. Uh, and this, of course, comes as companies are starting to become slowly, gradually, a little bit more confident about what the future holds, given now the German government have been um, loosening some of these quarantine type measures. Um, on that point, I think Germany, they plan to extend their social distancing until the end of the month. But obviously, there are a few phases along from where, say, the UK is at this point of time. Uh, on that front, talking of the UK, um, Boris Johnson, he delivered his speech uh, yesterday. He said UK shops will be able to reopen from June 15th, the lockdown to end June 1st for outdoor markets and car showrooms. And I, for one, being a father, cannot wait for nurseries to reopen uh, again uh, on the 1st of June, so not this week, the following week, uh, meaning that obviously a lot of parents and things can be get back to being more productive at work. Um, so yeah, again, why is this happening? Well, this is pretty much mimicked from, a, from across most Western parts of the world, uh, albeit uh, India, um, Brazil, a couple of these areas where the rate of infection is still rising. But in mainland Europe, in the UK, in the US, in China, in all those Far East countries, generally we've been seeing a pattern of no visible signs of a significant second wave occurring as yet. Uh, this is what the UK seven day rolling average looks like. This is the blue line. Um, and we're looking at the, the green bars and new confirmed cases. And above that, we're looking at daily test rate in the UK, uh, which is hovering just under 100,000 at the moment. I think it's around 75,000, the, the government was saying yesterday. Um, but it's the trajectory of the, the decrease then of this line on the seven day rolling average that is allowing the UK government to take these types of steps to gradually uh, phase in the more uh, unwinding of the lockdown. Uh, 
the other thing, of course, that dominated a lot of the, the press coverage over the weekend was um, the kind of chief advisor to the uh, the PM, Dominic Cummings. Um, a lot of a lot of uh, MPs, I think up to twenty Conservatives, looking for him to be to basically be pushed out, fired, or whether forced to resign because of his apparent breaking then of some of the legal uh, rulings around what would actually be conducive of the uh, adhering to the lockdown rules in the UK, and he him being the chief architect of those very rules. Um, I think I'm not going to talk about this a great deal. Um, the, the bottom line is, is that he's not going to resign. Well, we saw that quite evident yesterday. Uh, so it looks unlikely that's going to be the case. Uh, I do think that he, you know, he plays obviously a, a huge role behind the scenes, particularly for a Boris Johnson-led government. You know, He was the chief uh, architect behind that of the Leave campaign uh, of Brexit. He was then of behind securing Boris Johnson a majority government uh, with kind of the moving on of that similar theme. Uh, to um, delivering Brexit, so take back control, delivering Brexit to where we've arrived at now. So without him, he would be a huge loss. Um, so that really ratified as an idea, uh, and he's not going anywhere anytime soon. So I think I think the media fanfare will certainly die down. Uh, general public, although might not forgive, do forget relatively quickly. Uh, and he, you know, he's very, he's not really in front of the camera type guy like he evidently was yesterday. He is behind the scenes. And so I'm sure that um, the whole hysteria around this will, will die out fairly quickly. Um, but obviously the next big thing though that this, this lead us to is that if he still is in play, that does still leave a degree of apprehension about what exactly is going to happen to that end of June deadline, which is only four or five weeks away, where the UK has got to make some serious decisions about, you know, can they actually get together? Is it actually realistic they're going to make a trade deal by the end of this year? Or do they need to request an extension um, to the current transition period at the end of the year or a risk of being at a no deal Brexit once again? And uh, if Cummings is still in the mix, you've got to think that these things are going to come right down to the wire, of course. So, yeah, at the moment, markets not really phasing this in. And, uh, and as I said, I think it's uh, it's a lot of noise about not a great deal, really, at this point. Um, moving on, just wanted to point this out. Uh, this was from the World Health Organization. They were warning over the, uh, the weekend that, look, a second peak in areas where COVID-19 is declining is not... Um, off the table just yet so you know despite all of the positive things I'll be mentioning uh, there still is this kind of this echo of uh, of prudency or vigilance that that still needs to be um, put into place given how things are going at the moment I guess the biggest risk here uh, as far as the World Health Organization are concerned is that governments so not just the UK, but governments in general see this type of decline in the rolling average of new confirmed cases and they go too fast. They essentially accelerate then the reopening of their economy. You've heard of pretty um, testing relationships between, say, the Chancellor in the UK, Rishi Sunak, and the PM Boris Johnson, where Sunak really wants to get this government, this uh, economy reopen as soon as possible because that's going to then offset some of the, the economic damage that we've had. Um, but the PM very mindful then about the cost of life that could come through the mismanagement of this as well as his political fate. So, um, you know, these, these are the main things that if governments act too quickly, then all the more risk there becomes and there becomes the balancing act. But at the moment, the markets seem comfortable with the, with the current plans that are in place. Quick look at the, the calendar for the day ahead. Um, pretty quiet overall. There's not a great deal going on um, from a US data perspective. You've got the US consumer confidence coming a bit later on. From speakers, it uh, could be quite interesting. Obviously, from the Bank of England, you've got the chief economist Haldane. If you remember, not this week, the weekend before was when he spoke exclusively to the FT and he was kind of putting on yeah, this idea on the table of negative interest rates is one of many different tools of which they're investigating. But obviously, the the market jumping on that like wildfire about this growing chorus of bank officials talking about negative rates. So he is speaking at 10 a.m. this morning. Could be one to keep an eye on. Uh, you've got the chief economist from the ECB, Lane at 1:45, and Kashkari, uh, FMC voter and well-known Dove, speaking at 6 p.m. Uh, this evening. 
for the calendar for the rest of this week. Um, overall, the week is relatively quiet. So you know, monitoring the, the pandemic, government plans, uh, and also the ongoing trade war between the US and China are probably the main things still to be looking out for from a, from a sentiment driving point of view. Um, on Wednesday, you get Fed's Bullard. You've also got the beige book out of the Fed. Uh, so pretty quiet overall, I would say. Thursday, you get second reading of first quarter US GDP, uh, preliminary durable goods numbers. Fed's Williams takes part in a moderated discussion as well. Um, from the Eurozone, economic confidence, uh, preliminary CPI numbers coming out of Germany and Spain. And then on Friday, you've got the University of Michigan, but this is the final reading. A couple of numbers coming out of Japan overnight uh, in the form of industrial production, uh, consumer confidence, jobless rate. Um, Eurozone may flash CPI comes out from the Eurozone on Friday. Uh, some final GDP numbers through Europe. Uh, but that's about it. So, yeah, fairly quiet um, rest of the week. All right, that is it. Uh, I'm not going to go any further. So any comments, of course, any questions, please feel free to leave a comment. Absolutely happy to engage uh, on the commentary section on these videos. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel. All right, have a good week ahead. Thanks very much, guys.